Hey, I am here with Alex from uh, World. I'm going to say it wrong. I just knew. Is that, what is it, Alex? World Relief. Yeah. World Relief. Not Vision. Yeah. <laughs> Not World Vision. Yeah. Uh, world Relief. Gosh. I was like all ready to go. And then all of a sudden it, it just hit me. So no, World Relief. Great. Yeah. And so, Alex, tell us uh, who you are and where you're from and like your official title at World Relief. Yeah. So, yeah, my name is Alex Irby and I um, yeah, work for World Relief. Um, I'm from. Uh, Burleson, Texas is where I grew up, so just south of Fort Worth, and live in Dallas. I've lived in Dallas for the last, I guess, coming up on five years now, um, which is crazy. And my title with World Relief is um, Church Mobilizer and Good Neighbor Team Coordinator. So I help with all of our church relationships in Dallas, and then um, our Good Neighbor Team program. So it's teams of people that want to welcome refugees. I get to help come alongside and coordinate that. Yeah, that's quite the title. I think every time I try to remember it all, is is out there. It's a lot. It's big, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it's a big job, though. So I guess real quick, let's start off with um, what is World Relief, like in a nutshell? How would you describe it to somebody? Yeah, so World Relief is a Christian humanitarian nonprofit organization. Uh, their heart and mission is to empower the local church to serve the most vulnerable. Uh, and so... Yeah, in the U.S., we are a refugee resettlement agency, um, so a lot of welcoming refugees that are coming for the first time to um, the cities around the U.S. that we are working in, and then internationally, um, it's a lot of just helping mitig um, mitigate reasons why people are having to, um, might have to flee, like, to begin with, and we're coming alongside local churches in those places, um, a lot of, like, um, like natural disaster responses to, um, and just really helping um, to step in where there might be immediate need internationally. Yeah, so uh, I think I told you this before, but like this work was not on Journey's radar at all. And in mm -hmm. fact, I, when I came to listen to the presentation or I heard about the presentation, I still had no idea what I was getting myself into. And the way that I got turned on to it is there's a Facebook page, a uh, Facebook group for like millennial clergy members that I'm a part of. And yeah. one of the people in there just said, hey, we're coming to talk to the DFW area. Come and listen. And I was like, oh, that sounds interesting. Maybe I should go, at least, if nothing else, uh, and get free lunch out of it. You know, that's yeah. how, how the ministry world works sometimes. So I said, I'll get free lunch. So I told Jonathan um, that, hey, I'm going to go check this out. Do you want to come with me? And he said, yeah, sure, why not? And so we came, we listened to this presentation about World Relief, and like immediately our uh, wheels started spinning for what we could do um, to help out World Relief and to be to come alongside as as partners through this, through something called the Good Neighbors Team, which we'll, we'll get to here in just a little bit. But this problem of uh, refugee and asylum seekers, not problem, but um, this language gets used a lot to... Um, I think kind of sometimes muddy the waters of of who is good and who is bad and what's like the pro appropriate response. And one of the calls we have at Journey is to uh, follow the ways of Jesus and to be present. And so um, following Jesus is the Great Commission and to, to love God and love your neighbor. That's what we've been talking about this whole series is loving God and loving your neighbor and who is your neighbor. And then being present is just acknowledging that wherever we're at, like there is work to be done, which is kind of what... I think World Relief does very well because it partners with churches that are local, right? I mean, so you're not, you're working with people directly in the area where refugees are being resettled, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, I think uh, we could talk about, so let's talk about some of this language then, refugee yeah. and asylum seeker and all mm -hmm. that. I'm going to pull up the slide and then uh, then we'll kind of start there and then we'll go backwards through like what the narrative is that World Relief sees through scripture and and all that so uh, let me pull up uh, uh, let's start with this one I think this is a, a, an interesting slide here so talk to us a little bit about the 110 million yeah so yeah worldwide um, and these these numbers I think before October of this year it was closer to like 108 million um, people worldwide that um, are forcibly displaced um, and yeah, I think a lot in the last year is why those numbers have increased a lot is even you think about like the Ukrainian crisis and 
um, with Afghanistan. And there's just, it feels like in the last couple of years too, the global crises have just continued to increase um, a ton. And so, yeah, we're at now, um, which I think is, I mean, probably a, a record in the sense of how many people of water are actually displaced. Um, and so the, they, I guess the UNHCR, the United Nations um, High Commissioner for Refugees, categorizes within forcibly displaced people into different types of um, descriptions um, of like where people, their status is or where they're at in that process, maybe how they got there. Um, and so within forcibly displaced, they kind of break it down into different categories of refugees, asylees, asylum seekers, IDPs, which are um, internally displaced peoples, and then SIVs, which are the special immigrant visas. Um, so people that work for the military or the government, IDPs is more people that um, are internally within their own region and displaced. And I think on Sunday, we talked about like in Fort Worth out in Texas that you had to, and we had to flee to like New York, then um, we would technically be considered like inner, um, internally displaced people. Yeah, I think the last week or the, the Sunday before I had shared about moving to Texas. So I'm originally from Ohio, and I just celebrated yeah. two years of Texas um, living in November. And I, I shared with them like how even little differences there were confusing and jarring. Like something as simple as like registering yeah. your car. You know, like a, we register our car at different dates in Ohio. It's on your birth date, but in mm -hmm. um, Texas, it's on the day that you register your car. So like that's. I registered the car in June or something crazy like that. My birthday's in July. So like that's just enough of a hiccup to make it confusing. And I yeah. came with all of my stuff and my family and a welcoming environment and a job. And I was ready, like I was taken care of and it was confusing. So to think about just picking up with nothing or very little and being stressed because of what, you know, persecution or war or whatever, like it's just sometimes incomprehensible to me and it's hard to fathom i think for a lot of people um and you said 110 million i think it was very interesting what, what do you remember the statistics you gave on sunday for uh how much that represents like in the world population as a whole it was it was pretty small right yeah it's only like 1.4 percent um, of the world's population um if i think i googled it and it's like today there's estimated around 7.8 something billion people in the world um and so yeah, that's just something that um, is yeah, kind of just eye opening in the sense of like, yeah, it's actually a small percentage, but then you, you see 110 million and you're like, that's a lot of people. Um, and yeah, so it's kind of this interesting dynamic, but um, at the same time, it's like, man, those are people that are made in the image of God and that he cares about and he loves um, and that are in a lot of difficulty right now. And um, like you said, they're very overwhelmed. There's a lot of trauma that we've gone through. And um, yeah, so it, it's 1.4%. Yeah, I looked, I just looked up because I was, I was very curious about that number because on the one hand, you're right, it seems like, oh, it's like, okay, it's only 1% of the population. But as you, you it's like, that's the macro level of it, right? But the micro level is those are 110 million people. And what that is, is the DFW area, Dallas, Fort Worth, that's two cities, which if you're not from this area, I think is kind of mm -hmm. cheating because they're actually like 45 minutes apart, but whatever, that's a whole different story, <laughs> a different gripe for this area, but yeah. that's seven, 7 7.2 million or something like that. So that's like over 10 DFWs of people that are displaced. And when you kind of put, when wow. I put it like that, at least that's, that's a lot of people. I mean, could you imagine wow. yeah. 10, 10 of these cities this area, this metro area of people that are just like kind of of lost in a, in a sense, and um, sometimes for a long time. So let's talk about uh, I guess some of these actual definitions of um, you know so you can get mm -hmm. the technical terms um, for people to kind of have a, a frame point. So here are what you had given us. Mm -hmm. So walk us through some of these. Yeah. So. Um, refugees are probably the largest category that we see, um, specifically at World Relief. We majority are working with um, refugee people that have refugee status, and so um, yeah, refugees are again people fleeing from their home country due to fear in one of those areas of race, religion, nationality, 
um, or some kind of particular social group or opinion. Um, but for a refugee, they have to cross a national border into a second country in order to apply for refugee status. So if you're trying to, the war breaks out in Syria, um, you can't apply for refugee status within Syria. You have to cross over um, to the neighboring um, home uh, country and then um, like apply for, for refugee status, which is a lot of processes and screenings and it takes a really long time for that to happen. Um, and then asylees, so there's a similar reason for why they're fleeing, um, but they've had to travel to a U.S. port of entry. Um, and then, so they basically like show up at one of the ports of entry, um, and then they state their claim there at the like U.S. Um, border and then um, are granted asylum while they're in the U.S. Um, and then asylum seekers are really just a term for those that are, have, they've come um, and stated their claim, but they're um, still waiting to be granted their like asylee status. Um, a World Relief Titan, we don't see a ton of asylum seekers. Um, there are some good, there's a, actually an organization called DASH that's in Fort Worth that just works with asylum seekers um, because there's a lot more difficulty with that when you're an asylum seeker and you're coming and um, you're kind of in this weird like limbo time. So there's a lot of like needs and assistance that asylum seekers have. And then the SIV cases um, would be those who uh, partner with the U.S. government and military in their home country um, and their lives are, you know, endangered in some kind of way. And so, um, and again, the Afghanistan crisis is a good example of SIV cases because a lot of the people that had to um, were being, you know, flighted on all those massive planes that came over were working with the U.S. government. And so, they were kind of expedited in that process um, under a special immigrant visa. Yeah, that one was, uh, I had never known about that SIV status. That one's kind of important for, mm -hmm. I guess, myself and some of the people. I was in the military for a while, so we knew translators and people who helped us. So, like, um, that was an important one. And I think we kind of, I saw some of the miscommunication and um, trying to understand what some of these statuses are. And I guess then just to clarify a little bit further, refugees aren't necessarily going to be, um, refugees are people that have just fled to a different country be because of an immediate need, right? So like they could, so Ukraine, they flee, flee to like Germany. And when they're a refugee in Germany, they might get resettled somewhere else, right? Um, but an asylum seeker is they're trying to seek asylum in the country that they're entering. Is that kind of the difference? Um, I believe too. so. I yeah, know. I'm still and I've, I've worked on staff now for like nine or 10 months. And all of this was new to me, even like coming into this. And so I'm still learning and trying to understand all the like technical terms. Yeah. But to my understanding, yes, that is. Um, yeah, that is accurate. Yeah, and sure. a lot of Ukrainians and even like today, there's a lot with like Cubans and Haitians and Venezuelans that are um, having to like flee. And a lot of I know Ukrainians, a lot of them are coming on what's called like a humanitarian parolee status. Um, and I think similar to some of the like Venezuelan Haitians. Um, and so those are more like a temporary acceptance into the US. And so that there's like an expiration date on that. I think it's around like, a, it's like a two year thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so that has to then be like, the government has to decide, hey, are we gonna like, um, extend this or are these people going to have to, are they getting safety for this period of time, but then they're going to have to go back to their home country. Um, gotcha. So it's kind of like, a, so it's kind of like a, you're going to hang out here until the war is over and then we'll, you know, yes. send you back over. No, gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so interesting. So, yeah. Uh, and I think there was a somewhat some, for some of the Afghan, um, Afghanis, the Afghanis that were coming, there was a similar thing because I know that a lot of the clients that we serve, they were kind of nervous on that two year when this past August came up of expiration dates of things happening. Um, and I, I think it was extended, but there are different, um, which is, I think, also an important um, just encouragement of advocacy for um, families that are coming. And there are ways that we can help advocate within even the government of like our local senators and just people um, for different policies for um, just helping like our refugee neighbors that, that are here that are, you know, maybe living in that kind of uncertainty if they're gonna be able to stay or not stay. Yeah, huh. 
There's so much, so many moving parts. I think you know. Yeah, there really are. Like, yeah. <laughs> dealing with real yeah. life, like real lives and, and yes. real people. And yeah, I thought this. You put this slide up on Sunday. This is interesting. So, out of the 110 mm -hmm. million people that were uh, forcibly displaced, um, and uh, I, I, I do want to take a moment here to pause. And that word "forcibly" is important because I think sometimes people think, "Oh, well, you like chose to leave your country, or like yeah. you had to leave." But I, again, I just want to reiterate that most of the time, people are leaving. Um, for safety you know i think that like even jesus when he was surrounded by crowds like slipped into the the cracks of the wall to escape like uh, like being persecuted at the point that he was so you know the, there's very real fears that like you're forcibly removed not because like you want to leave your homeland or you want to leave the country that you call home but because if you stay it's going to be really bad and so as 110 million people forcibly displaced 62.5 are internally displaced, which is what you had said earlier, like people are kind of shuffled around their, their home area and mm -hmm. not really leaving their countries. 36.4 million are refugees. Those, again, are the people that have uh, fled to a second country um, because of whatever has happened in their own country. 6.1 million are asylum seekers, which is, uh, you know, that I think that number was shocking to me because that's, mm -hmm. I think, here, because um, we have people that watch this from uh, different states and around the country and stuff, but like in Texas, that's a huge talking point that everybody's coming in here to seek yeah. asylum and they're like trying to scam everybody, but 6.1 million people. And you had pointed out on Sunday that uh, most of these people are not, like 110 million people here that we're looking at are not like in the United States area, right? We're pretty mm -hmm. low on the, the list of people that are coming. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So um, I think it's like 1% of, I don't know if it's of the 110 million, but it's a very small percentage that we actually end up getting resettled all the way like to the U.S. Um, and so majority of refugees will end up, I think it's 76% uh, is a statistic that I heard of refugees hosted, are hosted in low and middle income countries. Um, and so yeah, which is just crazy, like to think about um, where there's already, you know, people already fleeing and then they're being resettled in a country that's already maybe in a difficult spot themselves. Um, I think um, a majority of uh, refugees end up in Turkey, Iran, and Germany, I think are maybe the top three host nations worldwide for refugees around the world, um, which even is crazy to think about, like with. Um, Turkey and like the earthquakes that happened, a lot of where the earthquakes happened were um, like Syrian refugees that had, you know, fled from Syria and were being hosted in Turkey from the Syrian crisis in 2015. And um, and then so they're even more, so a lot of the people within Turkey in that time period were probably considered in, internally displaced people's IDPs. Um, but yes, yeah, majority is not actually coming to to the U.S. A lot of them are in other parts of the world. So I think that to me, that just shows how even rem far more removed we actually are from the crisis um, at large. Yeah. Yeah. And I only point that out to just um, not downplay, I suppose, uh, the very mm -hmm. real struggles that certain communities face because of uh, mm -hmm. an influx of you know people wherever. And um, but it is kind of like. I think helpful to take a step back to look at the bigger picture to see what's mm -hmm. actually happening so we can better allocate our resources and our energies and like really sometimes our fears, I guess. I don't know, like the, mm -hmm. that um, there's work to be done and um, yeah. we're just got to keep going. And so this is all, you know, this is all important. And I did want to bring up kind of, I, I love this part. You kind of give this grand narrative throughout scripture of why this is important. And I'm going to put this slide up here and you can kind of, um, you don't have to, if you don't have your notes right here in front of you, or unless you're a rock yeah. star and you have all these spots memorized, but it just kind of goes through <laughs> the whole, uh, you know, the narrative from the, really the beginning to the end of scripture. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I learned someone shared this with me um, when I was in college and it was just really impactful for me to kind of see, because I know we see the the grand narrative of scripture in the sense of God is writing a story um, of saving people. Um, and that is what this is, but also even a grand narrative of um, what he's inviting us into as followers of Jesus. Um, and I think it's really helpful because I think when we talk about missions, when we talk about, you know, outreach, 
um, it can often be like, that's for like those select people or the few. Um, but really what I love about this is it just kind of shows throughout scripture that this is, this is for every follower of Jesus. And it's something that God is inviting us into. And so, um, yeah, in Genesis 1, 28, um, is really just this, um, commissioning for God, um, is saying like, to Adam be fruitful, multiply and like fill the earth and to do it. Like that's kind of the command and the task um, at the beginning. And then um, in Genesis three, that's when the fall, um, when sin enters into the world. And so this um, kind of image is being marred of like, okay, God's design is to like fill his image all over the world um, and to, to multiply, be fruitful. And then sin comes and kind of crushes that in a sense. Um, and then we see sin on full display. Um, one example of that is in Genesis 11, when um, you have the Tower of Babel scene and um, these people are basically wanting to just make an image and name for their own selves and not for God. And so they kind of get together and they start building this tower and it was as high as the heavens. And God clearly is didn't like that because he only is wants to be worshiped and, um, and glorified and, and not a man. And so he confuses their languages and so they can't communicate with one another. And then he scatters them throughout the world. And so that's kind of where we see people groups forming languages forming, which was very eye opening to me. <laughs> um, whenever I was first learning that, um, and then you get into Genesis 12, um, two and three, and this is really just, um, a, the call of Abraham and God's um, plan, he says, is to that through Abraham, all nations will be blessed. Um, and then we see themes of God blessing the nations throughout the Old Testament, even not just in the Great Commission, but like First Chronicles 16 is an example of that, where um, I think that verse says something along the lines of like declaring God's glory among the nations and his marvelous works among all peoples. And even scriptures like Psalm 4610, like that's a very classic one of like, be still and know that I'm God. But the, the second part of that verse says, and I will be exalted among all nations. Um, I'll be exalted in all of the earth. Um, and so it's this, it's both and it's like, yes, be still, know God, but he's like, I'm doing something among the nations. Um, and then Galatians 3, 7 through 9 is really just kind of this addition to, okay, God blessed Abraham and said, through you, all nations will be blessed. But those who are the children of Abraham, the children of faith, um, inherit that same blessing. Um, so that means that through the children of faith, um, all nations also will be blessed. And so we have that command and responsibility alongside Abraham, which is just really beautiful. It's this beautiful thing that God's given us as believers to steward that like we've been blessed with salvation um, and the gospel to bless the nations. Um, and then Matthew 10 is just an example um, and demonstration that um, the gospel first went to the Jews um, and um, yeah, this gospel of the kingdom that we read about throughout um, the gospels is for the Jew. And then in Acts 1a, it talks about that that now extends to all nations um, from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria to the ends of the earth that this gospel should go forth. And then Matthew 28 is the Great Commission where Jesus tells his disciples um, to go and to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Spirit, and that um, he will be with us like as we do this. Um, and then we see even further into the New Testament, Paul, um, who we know how fierce he was <laughs> to share the good news um, of Jesus, but his ambition, he said, was to preach um, the gospel in Christ where it had not yet been named. Um, and so taking the gospel to some of the, the most least reached places of the earth. Um, and then we have these beautiful pictures in Revelation. Revelation 5, 9 um, is, a, uh, um, I guess, a promise that, or a picture of um, God um, redeeming people from every type, tongue, and nation. And so that um, he He has had done that um, for um, when Jesus died on the cross, like that was for every tribe, tongue, and nation um, and people on the earth. And then Revelation 7, 9 um, is a, an image of the completion of that, where there will be a day 
um, um, before the throne that all people from every tribe, tongue, and nation are standing and worshiping um, the lamb. Um, and then even if you look at Revelation 6, 9, it talks about even um, that people will be um, like killed and put to death um, for bringing the good news to all nations. And so um, it's, yeah, anyways, that's kind of the great narrative of scripture and what God's up to and inviting us into. Um, so yeah. Yeah, that's cool. I think that, um, uh, uh, I say this, that it is not, I just to clarify that somebody even had this question mm-hmm. yesterday, that yeah. people, um, like you won't turn, world relief will not turn away people from help if they're not Christian, right? I mean, yeah. yeah so like the, the idea is, um, and from what I've heard all the talk so far is that these, these narratives and these beliefs through scripture mm-hmm. shape and form who world relief is, which then causes them to act because their neighbors are the people that might not look like them or believe like them or act like them, mm-hmm. but because that's who we are compelled to be. Even based mm-hmm. on some of these scriptures that we have up here is, you know, mm-hmm. the Leviticus. I preached on this one before, a funny story. Um, you know, <laughs> when a stranger resides, uh, or sorry, when a stranger sojourns with you in your land, uh, you shall do him no wrong. You shall treat the stranger who sojourns with you uh, as the native among you and shall love him as yourself for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Just a quick aside, you know, I, I, I preached a, a sermon on this and I mean, the first question that somebody came up to ask me after, you know, a half hour, uh, who knows, I'm going to say it's a really good sermon, but who knows if it was. <laughs> but it did not resonate with this person because he said, you know, like if, if um, uh, an immigrant came into our our church right now with the bomb strapped to their chest, what would you do? And I just looked mm. at him and I said, I don't know, like, what would you, what would a sane person do? But like, yeah. that's just kind of this idea of where the the warped view of others can come into play. Mm-hmm. That um, I think, I don't think if you know that whole grand narrative of redemption, like we, we do know the story of Jesus comes back to save us from our sins. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of like the personal side of it. But what, I mean, the reality is we exist now before that, the ending happens like we are in the current midst of of broken world right now and so sometimes the best thing we can do is just bring a little bit of light no matter what and one of the things we try to yeah. say at journey is um so it's to follow the ways of jesus and to be present so follow jesus and be present in our neighborhood and then give generously without expectation of return and that helps mm-hmm. keep us humble that like what we can give to others is not so we can get them to come to church necessarily because that, I think that shapes and warps our mission, but it is is that so people can be blessed because we have first been blessed. And I think an outpouring of that is it radically changes the interactions you have with people. Um, yeah, and that's because for we know sure. the story. So. Yeah, and I think going back to what you said earlier of, um, yeah, just these people aren't coming, like they're not just like coming to come per se, like they actually are grieving, like having to leave their home country and they weren't expecting that that would happen. Um, and so, um, yeah, I think that is can be a misconception. I think a lot when thinking of refugees or people coming, um, yeah, through these specific processes. I know there's a lot of, you know, different um, types of way that people are coming, but um, yeah, so I think, when we can actually see um, them as real humans with real lives and real stories and put ourselves in their situation. Um, and like they're, yeah, they're, they're humans <laughs> too. Um, then I think it can help us um, kind of break through some of those things that I don't, I don't know, like some of that might be the enemy. I think he can like, he does a lot of, you know, trying to divide and um, bring disunity um, and put up walls and barriers between um, you know, pe- different types of people. And um, there could be, you know, a numerous um, number of things of reasons why um, there is such, can be such hostility. Um, and a lot of refugees do face hostility in coming to the U.S. Um, but I think it's good to recenter our hearts on like, okay, what does scripture say? What is God's heart for all peoples and for the foreigners that are coming? Yeah. So, I, I, so with that, I want to bring up uh, the mission then of World Vision. Yeah. Let me pull this. Um, and so we'll do mission and then vision and then kind of how that plays out from both like the structural side of you all and then like how you guys partner with us as local churches and what that, that kind of looks like. So we'll start with mission, then the vision, and then we can talk about like both sides of them working together. 
Yeah. Yeah. So with the mission, um, again, it's to empower the local church to serve the most vulnerable. And so, um, yeah, World Relief, we really do believe that like the church is a key player in welcoming um, our new neighbors to the communities around us. Um, and so the church is one of, you know, the largest, most culturally diverse two organizations within the world. And so there's and there's a unique calling and um, responsibility for the church to um, and there the church is uniquely equipped to respond to the crisis, to needs, um, to this reality. Um, it's like governments, nonprofits, they're going to come and go. But the church truly will remain and is ultimately God's you know, pillar and um, the strength and light, you know, to communities across the world and to these families that are coming. And so that's why, our, yeah, this is, that's World Relief's um, vision, mission. And our vision is, um, yeah, to partner with local church and to really see the vulnerable people transformed in a holistic manner um, and really believing that when clients are served more in a holistic approach that they're able to truly thrive and integrate well into their new communities. Yeah, one of the things that I think really draws me to an organization like World Relief is um, what drew me to um, the Church of the Nazarene. So we don't really talk a lot about, um, like our denomination is the Church of the Nazarene. Um, mm -hmm. And it is a, um, you know, one of the statistics somebody gave, like we're like one of three truly worldwide church denominations in the sense mm -hmm. that we plant churches in different countries and have leadership structures in different countries, and they all like report to a, a global center. It's like us and the Catholics, and um, I forget who the other is. But um, what, anyways, what I like about it is we have the idea of going, this vision that you have, we have an arm called the Nazarene Compassionate Ministries, which mm -hmm. oftentimes are some of the first people um, to go to uh, like natural disasters and, and stuff like that, because we have churches like literally in those areas already that can already start providing the the ground support and if we don't have that then we have you know missionaries like a lot of other churches have missionaries but so we have this big worldwide network to help and to not only just like take over the the country or to like send um i, I don't know like we don't like it's not imperialism we're not like trying to send a bunch of white people out to a bunch of different countries and like make mm -hmm. them just like us it is about empowering the local person the local church where they're at Mm -hmm. um, to empower their community. So that's what like really draws me to this. Cause it's not just about, um, rescuing somebody to feel good about yourself. It's to yeah. provide the resources so that they can then go forth and be successful as well. Um, yeah. and, and not as like, uh, look what we did, but you know, that's what we were called to be, which uh, goes into kind of these three focus areas of which you all do. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's see if it'll switch slides here. Um, the vital services, uh, a just and welcoming community, and bring people together. It seems like so simple when you break it down to <laughs> these three yeah. things, right? Like, yes, yeah, so simple, but also very complicated. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, providing vital services. So um, that's not necessarily unique to World Relief because any resettlement agency, so all of the, I think there's like nine to 11, 10 or 11 federally recognized resettlement agencies in the nation um, and that work with the Department of State. Um, and so providing vital services are really just the things that the government is telling um, is saying like, hey, if you're applying for refugee status here, these are the things that we're going to provide. And so there's a list of services that we are providing um, for these families, which is so helpful because if they, you know, if we didn't have those, then um, that would be a really difficult, you know, situation that people are in. Um, but we do believe that um, some of our best work is done is really through the building just smoking communities and bringing people together. And so really with building just smoking communities is just really trying to empower and educate our community um, churches um, just in any way that we can um, um, so that we can um, really welcome people that are coming well and then do that in partnership with, um, with the local church. And so, um, yeah, we want our clients ultimately to integrate and invest into the communities that they're in and, and have long term, like um, be self-sufficient and um, self-sustainable. And so that is our hope is is um, doing that and empowerment 
through empowerment and education within the communities and then with the clients themselves. And then bringing people together is really just this idea that, um, yeah, engaging with people from different cultures is really a mutually transformative experience for everyone that's involved. And so um, we want our clients to be cared for, but we also want to see our cities and communities transformed um, by the knowledge and experience that our Im immigrant neighbors are bringing to the table. Um, and so really, you know, even as we see in God's heart for all peoples, that there is something really beautiful when we're sitting across the table from uh, a Syrian family or an Afghan family, and we're getting to have that interaction and, and communicate and exchange and learn about one another's cultures and relationships. And there's something really beautiful that I think reflects the heart of God um, in that. And so, yeah, those are kind of our three focus areas. Um yeah, and I think that point, that last point, is is so important about uh, like a mutually beneficial mm -hmm. relationship because I think some people can very quickly turn into, I have all the power, I have all the knowledge, I have all the resources, I have all like yeah, like you can really lord it over them, but really it's a position and a posture of humility that you're mm -hmm. going to serve somebody else who is like in a difficult spot in their life. And like you said, through that, we get to see, I think, the heart of God, the the creation of God, like right mm -hmm. in front of you through um, through somebody else. And that's a very cool, cool thing, I think. And if you've never had that opportunity, um, and that's not even just through, like just sitting down with somebody else from a different culture. <laughs> I mean, just to pick their brain is a cool thing to do. And, um, you know, we also get to do that then here. Well, you all get to do that through providing those resources and hopefully enriching mm -hmm. people's lives. And we do that through the Good Neighbor Team. So tell us a little bit about what the Good Neighbor Team is. Yeah, so Good Neighbor Team program is really, um, yeah, an opportunity for um, a small group within a church or just a team of people that want um, to welcome and walk alongside a refugee family um, for we kind of put a, a time frame just for like, um, I don't know, clarity's sake for everyone about six months, but knowing that like those relationships can for sure go beyond that time frame. Um, and so, yeah, good neighbor teams are really a beautiful, honestly, for within a church context, a great discipleship opportunity as a group, getting to like live for a season together in some even like missional community, like rhythms of like learning to work together and to communicate and coordinate and serve together, I think is a, a good way for us to grow. Um, and so I think it's a, yeah, a beautiful group opportunity um, to do together um, to learn how to be the hands and feet of Jesus and to grow in empathy and a lot of things. Um, but and a practicality, they walk alongside the refugee family for six months, and then you work alongside um, the Good Neighbor Team Coordinator at World Relief, and then the caseworker that's assigned to that individual family. Um, and you're building relationships, investing relationally at the same time, helping um, provide some of the core services, um, which I see you have that on the, the slide up there. Um, and so there's a variety of things that, yeah, kind of go into the Good Neighbor Team and that caseworkers provide, but um, we just kind of off of those the nine stability factors that we um, looked at on Sunday. Just kind of thinking like, hey, what's like the holistic approach here, um, and and so wanting to provide um, opportunities for good neighbor teams to step into some of. Um, just practical needs. Um, and so some of that is fulfilling some of the core service requirements that we have to provide as an agency on behalf of the government for these families. But then some of those opportunities, um, like helping them set up a bank account, that's not technically like a core service that we have to provide, whereas um, securing housing is a, is a core service that we have to provide. So the Good Neighbor Team is kind of a mix of opportunities of things that we feel like would help a family flourish while at the same time helping provide some of those core services. Um, and so things like helping them get to medical appointments or thinking through short-term or long-term transportation options. Do they need to, where's the nearest bus route that they can get on since they don't have a car when they arrive? Or can you help enroll them and their children in school? What is that process in the city of Dallas? Um, and just really kind of walking and um, and, and kind of taking them hand in hand at, at first, but ultimately to like model for them, hey, this is how you do this. And then hopefully the next time they can maybe do that by themselves or will need a little less assistance so that ultimately they can 
really be set up for success to thrive in their new community. Yeah, it seems like um, the uh, the word I thought about when you were explaining this on Sunday and the meeting before, it's kind of like, it's like almost like being a parent really fast and like yeah. teaching as many <laughs> American life lessons as you can <laughs> in a short amount of time. And then mm -hmm. I think the interesting thing that you have as part of this requirement of the Good Neighbor Team is that six month commitment. Because if I remember correctly, you said that the, the government requirement roughly is about 90 days, right? So mm -hmm. like 90 days is what you, the government essentially or whoever says this is what we have to get that's three months i mean that's pff, that's nothing yeah. i'm I've, going back yeah. to texas yeah. i've been here for two years and i'm still learning stuff you know what i mean yes. so yes. to be like you got three months to and again uproot like so some of these people have been mm -hmm. waiting for multiple years in a refugee camp right like 10 years mm -hmm. 15 years mm -hmm. and it's like all of a sudden they're like oh green light go and then okay so maybe you've even settled there for a decade and gotten used to that lifestyle from wherever you came from and they're like okay let's go and they put you on a plane and they fly you here and here you go, you get three months of government assistance and you're kind of on your own. <laughs> so yeah. the government, you know, the, the good neighbor team, I think is fascinating because it's, you're committing for six months, which I would imagine, mm -hmm. um, love or hate, you know, six months is enough time to, to get people set up and hopefully mm -hmm. it blossoms into a, a good friendship and relationship yeah. beyond that as yeah, well. Yeah, for sure. I know when I lived in Arizona for one year and, it took me like, I feel like, oh yeah, over a year to kind of, you know, like it to like, I feel like just when I was, it was time for me to kind of end up leaving. Um, I was like, I'm kind of starting to get my feet settled. And I'm like, that's in America. You know, I speak the same language. And so, yeah, imagining like coming from a really um, difficult situation and then into completely new language and context. Um, it's going to take a while, you know, um, for, for, you to to feel more acclimated for sure well you know i think uh what we're going to do then is we're going to offer this opportunity um well the people in dallas have already been offered the opportunity to sign up for this good neighbor team and i know we'll have to get maybe a little bit creative with some of our online people because i said some of them live in different parts of the the country but maybe this can spark something for them do you, oh i have a list of which states you're in i think right you yeah, have a list yeah. of states that, so if you yes. happen to be watching from one of these states or even one of these countries, because uh, here you said mostly yeah. we do, you all do um, the resettlement, refugee stuff, yeah. Yeah, resettlement. Mm -hmm. but if you're in a different country, you might be doing other stuff as well. Um, and if this, if World Relief is not in your city, then there's other, you, you can always help the whole cause by looking for different organizations as well but mm -hmm. here if you live in california illinois maryland minnesota new york north carolina south carolina tennessee texas washington or wisconsin then uh, you'll have a world relief group around you and you don't you don't have to be a part of a church to be part of a good neighbor team right like you can just get yeah. your friends together like a yep. bunch of do-gooders yep. we've and, had some <laughs> love, not yeah. we had like a non-profit team that like yeah. Uh, they actually did similar work, but they were like, we want to do a good neighbor team together. And we're like, great, sign up. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, so it could be like your book club or, you know, as long yeah. as you were yep. committed to to serving people. To who, serving families, yeah. Yeah, need it. And then international, Burundi, Cambodia, DR Congo, Haiti, Kenya, Malawi, Rwanda, South Sudan, and Sudan itself are, are the world areas that you have have put up here for us to know. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so I think if you are a part of that, then by all means, um, connect. If we'll, if you want, uh, if you're more interested in helping us, you know, just let us know. I'll put a sign up thing here in just a couple minutes, and then um, we'll go from there and figure out how to integrate you. But part of this is just helping you to know what we as Journey are doing uh, with the help of Alex and World Relief. And we are super excited to be a part of it. Alex, thank you so much for joining us on here. And, yeah, thanks for having and, me. Um, yeah sharing your experience and your story and um uh, we'll uh, see you again i'm sure so um that's Sounds it I think any, any parting words you got for us i don't think so yeah i'm just thank y'all uh, it's a yeah, gift right. to be here cool thanks well thank i'll you. see y'all later and uh we'll catch you soon